So today is, uh, this, this session is for our foundations folks. And um, we are going to have a follow-up session this afternoon at uh, 3.30, and that will be from Dan McNerney and, McInerney and Norm Jones on expectations to evaluation using rubrics to evaluate student coursework. Um, it's actually a very nice presentation that they've been giving around the nation, and so they'll be sharing that with, with all of us here. So um, a couple quick things, items uh, for you. Um, here at, on the Logan campus, we have our new testing center that is now open. It will be, um, it, you can go and take a tour of that. It's on the south side of the library. Um, there will be three open houses planned. Uh, I think it's Tuesday, September 27th from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m., so for the, most, for the whole day. And then Wednesday, September 28th, and that's 2 p.m. to 8 p.m. And then the last one is Thursday, September 29th, 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. And uh, the following Monday, it will be open for service. And as I understand, they already have um, tests scheduled and students have signed up. So it's a very fantastic cutting edge facility that has um, all sorts of securities in place, along with um, a lot of virtual proctoring that's available for those of you that are working out at regional campuses or at distance education. So um, if you do have any questions about that, you can contact Chris Daly um, there at the testing center. Uh, so um, today uh, we uh, have here with us uh, both Matt Saunders and Hairston Kleiner out of um, College of Chass that will be sharing with us uh, some information that they shared with our, um, at the orientation of our new students. And, um, and the idea is to give us a, some foundation and an understanding of what our students are being told as they come into the institution so that we can build on those, or at least you can build on those in your classrooms. Um, in addition, for all the foundation's uh, faculty, we are going to be um, sending you out um, uh, this book here from Matt Sanders, Becoming a Learner, that all of our students also received, I believe. And uh, so if you're watching this as a presentation and having this book, they are going to go hand in hand. So on that, I would like to turn the time over to both Matt and Harrison. Thank you. Thanks, John. I appreciate that. Um, so our goal here would be to help you understand what the students are getting when they come into the university, the message that we're sharing with them about what the university is and why they're here. And one thing that, that I use in the Becoming a Learner book that frames a lot of it is this saying of the hardest thing for you to know is the thing you think you already know. And we get a lot of students coming into college and they think they know what college is. Because they've been doing school since they were in you know, kindergarten or preschool and they, they sit in the classrooms, they know syllabi, they know everything that's going on. And so they get here and they think they know what it is, but then they're not really understanding it because there is this cultural narrative out there. Um, I call it a confusing and a damaging story. But the way that college is being talked about is actually creating a narrative for them that pushes them to engage college in ways that work against their own best interest. So here's a couple of quick examples. And every few weeks, it seems like a couple of more appear. Um, of course, we're all familiar with uh, Senator Stevenson's taxpayers are subsidizing degrees to nowhere. Um, the North Carolina governor, Pat McCrory, if you want to take gender studies, that's fine, but we're not paying for it. We're not subsidizing these kinds of degrees. Um, Harrison will appreciate this one. The welders make more money than philosophers, and we need more welders and less philosophers. Of course, that's not true. We don't have more philosophers than welders, and philosophers make more money than welders. <clears throat> and even President Obama, you know, disparaging an art history degree, making the argument that it doesn't make any money. And so we get this story that the students pick up, and they come to college thinking, this place is a spot for me to just get my degree and get a job. And they see college as professional job training, which makes most of the university confusing. But this is the story we hear in our legislatures and in politics. This is the story that on most uh, news outlets when they cover higher ed, this is what they're talking about. And this is. These are the conversations that happen in homes and in apartments. And so we wanted to get away from this conversation and have a, a real 
serious discussion with the students about what is college about, what are the ends of higher education, and how can you embrace that to take full advantage of your education. So I'm going to pass this over to Harrison, and he'll dive in deeper on that. Thank you, Matt. OK, so I never use PowerPoint, so I'm going to be clumsy about this. I'm a philosophy professor, and so I get quite a lot of this kind of complaint that Matt was just describing. Students, you know, why do I have to take a gen ed course? I'm going to be an engineer. Why do I have to learn how to write? I'm going to be an artist. Why do I have to know anything about science? And so these complaints that if you teach any general education courses at all, you will encounter. Um, but even if you don't teach general education courses, you know, how are you going to talk? You're an engineering professor. How are you going to talk to your engineering students about the value of courses outside of the major? Uh, students tend to not have much of a conception about this. Now, the insight that we had that led to us totally reforming our first year student orientation program is that complaints are pleas for meaning. It's easy for faculty to hear complaints from students and then scoff and complain about entitled students and all of the rest. And some of that might be true. Um, but it doesn't change anything. It doesn't do anything. It doesn't make anything better. Complaints, we decided, are pleas for meaning. The students are asking these questions because they don't have an answer. Um, right? They've, been, they've heard the damaging story their entire lives, from their guidance counselors to the president to their parents, have been telling them you go to college to maximize your earning potential. And then they show up in you know, Mark Damon's Latin course, or my philosophy class, or somebody's you know, physics course, or something like this. And they complain because they don't understand why they're there and what they have to do. Here tends to be the student's mindset. They think in terms of, what can I do? Right? Make this immediately practical to me. And if I don't see its immediate relevance to my career track, they don't think it has any value. Students tend to think that their career and life is going to unfold in a really tidy, straight line, major job success, happiness, right, in this straight shot. Now, a lot of the complaints, and Matt already uh, uh, suggested this, a lot of the complaints we get from students in general education courses or about everything that the degree requires of them come from this mismatch. Students ex expect one thing, but college mission statements express a much different self-understanding about what we take ourselves to be doing here. And on your handout, I had a brief bit about the kinds of things you tend to find in college mission statements, including ours. And the kinds of things you tend to find in college mission statements are not so much what can I do, but who do you become kind of language, right? Lots of language about becoming citizens, about becoming scholars, about becoming uh, informed consumers of ideas, right? Critical thinkers, all of this kind of language. The university tends to, tends to speak in terms of value of the whole degree. Students are really major focused. But unless you're a mechanical engineering major, that's like 90 credits or something, but most majors outside of the College of Engineering have 30 to 40 some credits for the major. You need 120, 120 credits to graduate, which means that for most students, the major is only a third or even just a fourth of what they actually do at college, right? Another third or fourth or so is general education, and the rest of that is electives or a second major or a minor or whatever the student might choose. But the trouble is, is that when students think that it's only the major that matters and all the other courses are irrelevant to me, they end up writing off 60, 70 percent of their college education as irrelevant and a waste of time. Obviously, the college doesn't think that 70% of their coursework is a waste of time, right? Because college is interested in a broader outcome, right? College is not mere job training. We're in the business of producing educated persons. So without a compelling why, the what's and how's don't really matter. And I think this is actually a useful teaching tip in general. If students don't know why you're having them do whatever it is they're doing, they aren't going to like it. 
But if you can explain to them clearly and coherently the value of whatever individual assignment, whole course, whole degree, pro, whole program, whole degree, the what's and how's tend to fall into place. But all of us are this way. If you don't know why you're having to do something, you tend to gripe about it. So uh, we have reframed our um, um, first year experience course around these big why questions. And one of the keystone pieces of it is Matt's Becoming a Learner book. So the Becoming a Learner book is given to every student as they come to SOAR, to the orientation day. And I get up and sing and dance in front of them for about 20 minutes and help them think through this idea of, of what it means to become a learner. And uh, Harrison, would you flip to the next slide there? This is the, the whole thesis of the book. The primary purpose of college isn't to learn a professional set of skills, but the primary purpose of college is to become a learner. And I walk them through this idea that helps them think about more, think more broadly about what it is they're doing here and why. And I've laid this out in that talk with a nice analogy to athletics, because I went over there to speak to them a couple of times about becoming a learner. And so I asked all these athletes why they would do so much exercise and training. Like, what's the point of lifting weights and running? Because I don't, the pinnacle of my athletic career was the sixth grade. Right? I mean, I'm a professor, so. <clears throat> and we talk about how and these athletes, it was just, it was so brilliant as they talked to me. And I said, well, why would you want to do squats or the bench press? Or why would you need to run? Like, what's the point? Because you don't do any of that stuff in a game at all. None of, that, none of that stuff is repeated. And it's certainly not important whether you can put weight on your shoulders and go up and down. But they had all these really immediate, quick answers. Like, I need strong legs and thighs to have you know, thrust and push on the offensive line, and my, this is the biggest muscle in my body, and that's why I do it. And they had these answers really quick and really easy for the bench press and for running and all of these things. They really knew why they were doing what they were doing, even though it was disconnected from the actual performance in their game. And the real takeaway is that these athletes wanted to thrive and flourish. As athletes, regardless of whatever they were doing, they wanted to be athletes and become better. And then I just relate that back to Gen Ed. When you're taking math, you're lifting weights. When you're doing all that writing, you're lifting weights. When you're learning a language, you're running it. You're doing all of these things to develop yourself. And this is why you're here. And we really try to drill this message in that there's more to it. And if you come into college thinking, I'm here to get some job skills and get a job, then the university is going to disappoint you. And like Harrison said, most of what you do it's going to be frustrating, and you're going to be upset. And you're going to ask all these why questions. So we spent some time chatting with them about that and helping them understand, particularly in terms of job skills, that even the, the technical skills you might learn, they're going to be obsolete by the time you graduate or shortly thereafter. And there's a nice story in the book of an engineer who had spent his career in electronic data storage, and he talks about the process of his career and how what, it, what he learned in college in 1959 was obsolete when he graduated and the trajectory of his career and how all of that changed. So we're really building up this story. And the book is designed to help them talk differently about college and learning to inspire a conversation. That's why it's so short and simple. But it's taking them through and challenging this idea and then talking to them about the importance of becoming and the outcomes of that. And then it plays around with some of these conversations that they have, like when I go to the real world, in the real world, and how that's kind of a, that's a false narrative. You know, I had a student who said, well, in the real world, I'm going to show up to work on time, and I'm going to do all this stuff. Like, well, no, if you can't come to class on time, don't think that it's going to be easy to wake up in the morning and go to work, right? Or they see the, you know, the disconnect in their learning, or this idea of, like, I'm paying for it, so it better be good. But it's this consumer entertainment. And so I'm challenging some of these ideas and then giving them different ways to talk about it, that learning requires relationships and that knowledge is interconnected and that they need to have some humility and some courage to learn. And it's been a great 
conversation piece for the students because a couple of things happen. Most often, students will say, I had never thought about college like that before. That's all the anecdotal evidence we get is, I had never thought about this before. And if they had thought about it before, it becomes, this is what my dad was telling me before I came. But now a stranger writes it in a book, and so it's true. You know, and when mom or dad or your teacher says it, it doesn't really matter. So we're getting a lot of a good response, and the data is starting to come in from our assessment of this, that it's starting to shift their mindset a little bit. But we want them to, to embrace this, because when they embrace the whole degree and the whole university experience, they're going to actually meet the kind of instrumental and vocational ends that, that they're hoping for in the first place and that employers are asking for. And Harrison will lay that out for you here. OK, so I'm going to talk a little bit more about those um, in connections and how we tend to frame this discussion about education. So the students come in with this highly vocational, instrumental view of education. Um, we're not either or folks, right? I mean, I think that a college degree is instrumentally valuable, but it's also intrinsically useful. So something is intrinsically useful if it's chosen for its own sake. The easiest example, I think, is beauty. Beauty is more often than not something that's sort of chosen for its own sake. A poorly organized garden that does not have nice, tidy rows might be equal, just as productive in terms of its yield as a garden that has very carefully laid out rows. But everyone would choose the beautiful garden, not because of its usefulness, because the poorly organized garden is just as useful, but because there's something about a beautiful thing that is intrinsically valuable. The university has, from the foundation of universities in the Western world, had this view about knowledge. Knowledge is its own end. It's desirable for its own sake. And I suspect that if you talked to almost any faculty member at the university, even if they are in highly instrumental fields, they have intrinsic motivations that really get them up in the morning to do what they like to do. One of my friends on campus is a geology professor. And some of her work has to do with earthquakes and you know, could we figure out um, seismic movements in such a way that we might be able to do a better job of predicting earthquakes. Now, that would be really, really useful if it turns out that we could do a better job of predicting earthquakes. And I'm sure she's perfectly pleased that her work might have that outcome. But it's not why she's a geology professor. right? It's just she loves studying geology sort of for its own sake rather than for the sake of something else. We really, I think, have to push that kind of message with our students because they have gotten such heavy doses of instrumental language about education. And this is the thing where Matt said, when you talk to students this way about education, what they always say is, no one has ever <laughs> described education and its value in that way to me in my life. And here's the thing. Young people are young, which we should use to our advantage, right? They're, they're still somewhat idealistic, right? And, and they are intoxicated in a good way by this idea that you could do something here at the university that's really intrinsically valuable. I think the best analogy for sort of general education, liberal education, and, and the sort of value of the whole degree is, is health. Health is the name that we give to the good of the body. And health is both intrinsically valuable and instrumentally valuable. We choose to be healthy for its own sake. It's just good to be healthy. But on the other hand, it's also useful to be healthy, right? Because you can work more efficiently and do more and feel better and a whole bunch of other valuable ends. Liberal education and knowledge are the good of the intellect. The good of the intellect used to be called intellectual virtue. These days, it's called critical thinking skills and other kind of you know, contemporary fad ways of describing it. But it's, it's the intellect brought into a healthful condition. The intellect brought into a condition where it's been cultivated such that it can perform its function well. That's what health does for the body. When the body is healthy, it can perform its functions well. When the intellect is healthy, when it is uh, actualized, right, it can perform its functions well. Now, what are these functions? <clears throat> the real end of the degree, I think, uh, is speaking in instrumental about instrument, excuse me, intrinsic ends rather than instrumental. I'll turn to instrumental ends in a moment. The intrinsic, choice-worthy, for its own sake, ends of the whole degree 
and perhaps liberal general education in particular, is enlargement of the mind. We're not really in the business of content delivery. Now, of course, every single course has content because you can't learn to think well unless you have something to think about. But if you've ever studied anything about memory, and you might avoid it because it's extremely discouraging, your students will forget, you know, 90% of the content from your course is within like, you know, 86 hours after they heard it or something like this, right? And certainly six months out, they're not going to remember a thing about Plato's theory of forms, right, in my classes or whatever else. They just, the fact is, and there's a whole boatload of research demonstrating this, that this content is not retained for very long periods of time. In fact, it's retained for shockingly short periods of time. Now, I'm not an anti-content guy. I'm all for content, right? But it's worth thinking about the sort of the place that content has. We're not in the business of sort of distributing information. Uh, Paulo Freya calls this the banking model of education, right? Where he says, on the banking model of education, the professor has a bunch of capital in the form of knowledge. The students sit out there and passively have it sort of deposited into their accounts. They make a deposit of their own every once in a while in the form of a test or a paper, but only to make the ultimate withdrawal at the end of a degree. But that's not really the way that the intellect gets cultivated, actualized, and developed. Right? We use content in order to get them to learn how to think. And people that can think well have the capacity to view many things at once, which is a hard thing to do, but in an increasingly complicated world where every single problem is multifaceted and no single discipline has some sort of monopoly on solving this social problem, right, or solving this economic problem or this environmental problem. We all know that we have to bring to bear all of the resources from our various disciplines on these complex global problems that we face. So students need to learn to be able to hold multiple perspectives at once, to think alternative perspectives all the way through. Aristotle once said, the mark of an educated person is, is, the, is the ability to to carry through a belief without believing it. Hold a, consider something without actually holding it, right? That is, think something all the way through, even if it's not your view. Or, you know, all right, so what does my philosophy class, what does my ethics class have to do with what I'm learning in physics? And what am I learning in physics, what does that have to do with this engineering question? And what does that have to do with this communication within the family question? How do all of these things fit together? That's why general education programs require students to engage a whole host of disciplinary lenses. If you didn't know and you're new to the university, USU has um, a distribution model of general education. We don't have a core. Instead, students have to take a breadth humanities, a breadth social science, a breadth life science, a breadth physical science, American institutions. I think I forgot one. And one other. <laughs> Um, and then quantitative and communication um, literacy and intensive courses, right? So they may take a philosophy class, they may take a history course, they may take a physics class, they may take a geology class, right? It's, it's whatever has those sort of designations. We require that for a reason. It's because of this end, right? That we're trying to get students to be the kind of people who can view many things at once. The other thing that educated people can do is they can synthesize, organize, give meaning, and give place. And I, this is from John Henry Newman. Um, he said the, the liberally educated mind is in the habit of pushing things up to their first principles. And I don't know who said this, but somebody once remarked that there's nothing more practical than a good theory, right? Because if you have first principles that are clearly articulated, then what practical reasoning is, is simply taking first principles and then thinking through the particulars of this case and seeing how that principle would apply to these particulars, or to those particulars, or to those particulars. And so that capacity to not be trapped by particularity, right? Not to not be trapped by the contingencies of this time and this place, but instead to be able to sort of push things up to a first principle, seeing things from many different perspectives all at once, synthesizing them, seeing how they integrate and connect with each other, that's the goal. That's, that's what the university is in a certain sense always valued. Happily, I think it still values it. 
If you look at our general education program and citizen scholar objectives, it talks a lot about this kind of language, right? Of integration, synthesis, analysis, criticism, all of these kind of family of skills that when taken together make someone that we would call educated. I think it's really valuable to talk this way to students, right? These sort of intrinsic ends of education. They are just, it's so foreign to them to imagine that you would choose education for its own sake. But it doesn't mean, of course, that there aren't instrumental ends, right? Beneficial consequences to becoming this kind of an educated person. Um, college mission statements typically identify two kinds of useful outcomes. One, social ends, and two, professional ends. Here at USU, we articulate these social ends in terms of our citizen scholar objectives. There's an American Institutions course that is a Utah state law that all public colleges and universities in Utah will require. So we want our students to sort of know something about how government works, know something about civic life, how to engage productively within the public square around civic, political, cultural questions, right? And those kinds of social ends are valuable. I always stress because um, USU has roughly the same percentage of women incoming freshmen as the national average, but a much, much lower percentage of, of percentage of women that are graduating from college. A lot of our women start, but they don't finish. And I always try to remind my uh, female students that even if they don't want to work, because of course their attitude is you go to college in order to get a job. I don't want to get a job. Why would I go to college, right? But the trouble is there's other, benef there's other beneficial social ends. There's a bunch of studies about mothers with college degrees as compared to mothers without college degrees. And mothers with college degrees, their children are more su successful on basically every single measure of well-being you can imagine. Higher literacy rates, higher college graduation rates, higher high school graduation rates, lower juvenile crime, lower drug use, lower teen pregnancy. I mean, sort of every single measure that you can think of. Um, uh, their children will benefit from their having a degree even if they don't finish, uh, um, excuse me, even if they don't end up getting a job. What our students, of course, are really interested in, though, are the professional benefits. And let me point you to the back page of the handout. <coughs> students end up being quite surprised at what employers actually want from them. Uh, they end up imagining that what they need are a collection of technical skills that then would get them some super high paying job. And in some cases, that's true. If you go to, I think it's called payscale.com. It's a website that shows all the pay salaries for different kinds of college degrees. And the top seven are engineering degrees. <laughs> so if you want to make a lot of money, sure, be an engineer. But guess what? Engineers have to write. I live like three doors down from the former dean of the College of Engineering. And he was outside of my house a summer or two ago. Um, and we were talking. And I was telling about how his engineering students you know, complained to no end in my classes about how much writing I require of them. And the dean of the College of Engineering said, what do they think engineers do? Don't they, think, don't they know engineers have to write grants, write summary reports, write explanations of what they're doing? They've got to somehow take this technical information and translate it for a broader audience at some point. So it turns out the AACU does this huge national survey of employers all across the country asking them, look, what do you want from your college graduates? 93% of employers said they do not care what students major in. My students are floored by that statistic. They think the major is all that matters. 93% of employers said they just don't care what students major in. Even those that do care, like, you know, in order to be a chemical engineer, you probably have need to have majored in chemical engineering. But we had a, a CEO of a Utah engineering firm down in Salt Lake City up here a couple years ago and asked him, what do you want from your students? And he said, look, obviously I want people with competent engineering skills, but I also need somebody that I can send to Brazil tomorrow. And he's going to be able to engage with another culture and a different set of expect cultural expectations about how you do business, maybe has a second language. Right? A whole bunch of other what sometimes are called soft skills, though it turns out the soft skills are hard. 
right? Because it's hard to learn how to write. It's hard to learn how to communicate. It's hard to learn how to be a critical thinker. I mean, these soft skills are actually difficult to cultivate, which is why the general education program is really only a piece of a much larger degree profile, we call it around here sometimes, that is meant to bring about these ends. And then if you look at gen ed outcomes, here's the table. I put a sort of list of general education outcomes that you commonly see in gen ed programs, including our own on the left side. And then I went to several surveys asking employers about what desired skills they wanted from college graduates. And while in some cases the language is slightly different, the gen ed outcomes are essentially a pre-professional program, right? I mean, with the kinds of outcomes you would cultivate in those kinds of courses are exactly the kinds of things that our employers are saying are the most important to them. Liberal education and general, educa uh, general education outcomes are 21st century job skills. Um, and it's really quite remarkable to see the extraordinary overlap between the two. So as much as I went on, as philosophers are wont to, about the intrinsic ends of things of, of, of a liberal education, liberal education pays off, right? In human flourishing, right, in, in living a good, fully actualized human life, but it also pays off in dollars, too. So how have we, we wanted to get a bit more into the weeds about how we've talked to students about this, because roughly, Heidi, help me, 60, 65 percent of incoming freshmen take connections. 70%. So all students have to do this SOAR um, uh, orientation, either on campus or online. And so all incoming students get Becoming a Learner, uh, every single one of them. And it's a quick read, really written at their level. Uh, the vast majority of my students have read it, uh, even if they were never asked to. And 70% of students take Connections, which is our first year orientation. Um, student orientation, so it's three and a half, no, now three uh, intensive days before the semester starts with a couple follow-ups that go out through into the semester. So we wanted to talk a little bit, and Matt, chime in here as you, uh, when you have things to say, about the kind of thing that they're hearing, because 70% of your students will have gotten this message that we just described in one of these formats. And what we want you to do is know, one, these students have been impressed with this message. And so I can expect them to understand some of this language. And, and you don't have to start from zero with them, right? Carry what we've sort of started in some of these programs and carry it forward in your classes is what we hope you'll do. So the Connections program is designed around three big questions. The first big question is, why am I here? Why, would, why should I go to college at all? And that's where we're having a really thick conversation with these students about becoming an educated person, thinking less in terms of my major being my destiny, and more thinking about the value of the whole degree, thinking not just about professional ends, but also social, civic outcomes, as well as personal fulfillment outcomes that one can get from getting a college degree. The second big question, sorry if I is how do I, given those ends, and we actually make them write a paper at the end of Connections where they articulate their own education mission statement, where they say, here's why I'm going to college. Here's the value that I see. And here, and we also require that they explain the different parts of the degree, general education, depth exploration, um, the major and electives, and they have to explain those different parts of the degree how those different parts of the degree inform each other and the value that each of those parts of the degree has for them. So they've engaged in a pretty intentional exercise of thinking about what am I doing here and what is the university asking me to do while I'm here and why is it asking me to do that? I suspect actually that some of our incoming freshmen have a better handle on the degree profile than some of the faculty do, right? Um, so you, know, you can expect them to be reasonably conversant about the value of the different parts of the degree and whatever you teach and wherever you fit into that degree, right, the value that you're giving them. The second big question is, well, given those ends, how do I 
How do I become successful? This is the what's and how's stuff. What kind of um, academic skills do I need? Um, how can I get better at preparing for tests? How can I get better at taking notes? Um, how can I um, get better at writing? What are the resources available for me to improve on those skills? Writing lab centers, math tutoring lab, whatever it might be. Um, advising. How do I interact with advisors, and what's the role of advisors, and how can they help me to get to where I want to go? And the third big question is, how do I become a fully engaged member of the university community? We don't want them to think that they're just consumers buying a product on the side, right? Getting a college education is not like buying a ham sandwich. Um, because a, a college education is meant to be transformative for a person. Right? That if, if somehow you graduated from college basically the same person you were when you, be, when you started, something had gone wrong. It's okay if you believe all the same things when you end college as when you started, but I would hope that you would hold those beliefs in a different way on the, on the back end than the way that you held them when you came in, or else something would have gone terribly wrong, either on the student's end or on the university's end. And so the university is meant to be a learning community. Right? A, a community that they engage in wherein all of these wonderful transformations of their self can occur. So we talk a bit about what does that mean to be a part of this community? How should you behave in class? What does civic discourse look like? Um, uh, what are the professor's expectations of you going to be in terms of your ability to write, your ability to communicate, your coming to class on time, submitting assignments on time? How can you get involved in other ways? You know, what kind of clubs are there? Um, what kind of extracurricular opportunities are there? What kind of internships? All kinds of, right, because beyond merely the classes they take, there's, of course, all of these other things that college students do that are hugely important to bringing about this end that Matt and I have been describing today. The last piece of connections is common literature experience. So everybody that does connections, they all read the same book over the summer. They write a paper about it and have some discussions about it. In the last few years, we have been gearing our common literature selection to all of these ends that we've been describing. So we've tried to pick a book that dovetails in with all of these other conversations we're trying to have with them. So a couple years ago, we read Frankenstein. Last year, we read The Emerald Mile, which had to do with a kind of the interdisciplinary problem of water management in the, in the West, in a certain sense, right? This year, we read How We Got to Now. It was a history of sort of innovation and how innovation happens by lots of different insights coming together um, fortuitously at certain times. Do you have anything you want to add to any of that, Matt? The last thing, then, that we really want to push is to have this be pushed through general education and the majors. And that's where all of you faculty come in. We, we don't want connections to be the last time they hear their faculty talking to them in this way and about these things. Um, I mean, I think we're doing a pretty effective job. We're starting to get some data back where we're measuring how, whether or not we're getting the outcomes we want. And there's early promising suggestions. But they have heard hundreds, if not thousands of times before they got here, the damaging story that Matt relayed. And so us telling our story, the university's story, you know, for a few weeks is probably not of enough of an antidote, <laughs> right? Since so we really want faculty to buy in on this project with us, that whether you teach only upper division students or you teach first year seminar, or, you know, first year lectures or anything in between, you have a place in bringing these ends about for students, and you should talk to them about them, right? Here's the piece I'm giving you. And here's why these other pieces are really, really important for you, too. Matt, do you have anything to add before we open it up for questions? Yes.
By the way, it's not considered on-load teaching, so it's extra service, but you get extra service compensation. You get paid for your time, and the provost has been extremely supportive of this, so I think you'll find that if you want to do this, department heads have been sort of uh, gotten the message from the provost level that this is a really valuable thing to do, and we'd really like faculty to do it if they can. Thank you for bringing that up, Heidi. So any questions or comments or kind of experiences you have? It's a good question, and I don't, I don't know where all the, the roots of that come from. But some of it, I think, stems from previous generations, like my dad, and he went to college, and even he didn't even have a full degree. It's like, oh, you went to college? Like, go be an accountant at the, you know, he was, he was loading cars at the railroad, you know, and they're like, oh, you've had two years of college? You should go up in the accounting office. And if you knew my dad, I mean, this, it's the last person you would ever want, like, <laughs> controlling your money. I mean, he's kind of an artist and a carpenter and, like, but he's just, that's what he thats what he did. And I think there used to be fewer people going to college. And there were, there were more jobs available. There was less competition. There was a huge service industry. And so people who went to college just got good jobs. I mean, that was kind of, you did this, and then you got the degree, and then you got a good job, and it was an easy track. And that's, there's less of those sort of labor jobs out there now. And people want college to be more, uh, you know, more of a guarantee. And I, I kind of see that moving that way. But I don't know all the historical roots of well, I think there's another piece, from. too, though. So one, students are worried about getting jobs, right, which is understandable. It's uh, especially after 2008, right? So I mean, it's an understandable worry. I want to make sure that this pays off for me in this way. And of course, we want it to pay off for them in that way, too, right? I want all my students to get good jobs when they graduate. Another piece, I think, is the American universities essentially adopted the kind of German research model. And as you started getting increasing state and federal investment and support of those institutions, um, government bodies started seeing universities as engines for research and economic development. And in some ways, they are those things, right? Um, but I think oh, you see it in some of the damaging conversation stuff. There's a lot of, we're making an investment. I want a return on my investment. And the trouble with the, the account that we gave is those outcomes are hard to measure. It's easy to see employment figures, right? Average salary for college graduates. These kinds of benchmarks are easy things to measure. And so for a state legislator who says, hey, I want a return on my investment, those are easy returns to show. This kind of enlargement of being is a little harder to it's a little harder to measure. Civic competence is a little harder to measure. Now, I think most people would recognize we've got a sort of disastrously low bar for civic competence in this country, and I think we should be considering that to be a crisis on par with whatever STEM crisis we may have, right? But I just think some of those things are qualitative instead of quantitative, so they end up being harder to show up on a spreadsheet, and so it's harder to speak the language that sometimes I think the stakeholders that are invested in this want to speak. That's at least my own two cents about why it's hard to get this argument to get more traction. <laughs> By the way, there is, a good, there, there is a good story to tell about this, though. The guy who had the degrees to nowhere, Stevenson, right? He then went out to lunch with 
Rob Behunin, who was the director of uh, research and commercialization or advancement at the university. But uh, Rob Behunin had a PhD in medieval and Renaissance literature. But then he went into kind of entrepreneurship and fundraising development, this kind of stuff. And so they went out to lunch, and Stevenson told him, this, these degrees to nowhere. We want colleges to produce more people like you. <laughs> and Rob said, do you have any idea what I have done? Right? I have a PhD in medieval and Renaissance literature. And that guy has not said that since. So I mean, I do think that if we find some success stories, that's a valuable way of sort of convincing those that need to be convinced. It doesn't seem as tidy to them. Yes. But I think part of the problem here, and this is where complaints or a plea to meaning really sort of motivated us. I don't think the universities themselves have done a very good job of the data is on our side, right? The arguments are on our side, I think, in the end. But we have not done a very good job of telling our story, of communicating the value that we bring. And, that's, and we're trying to address that here at USU in, in part. But I think that's a national problem. Universities just have, have, have not done an effective job of telling their own story, even when they have the evidence on their side. But the story isn't complex. I mean. I've been at a number of universities that have used Becoming a Learner and talked to others that, have, that are using it, and there's a consistent, overwhelming, positive response to the message. The students almost feel a sense of relief because they know they're going into something bigger than just getting a, 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 a job, right? They want that transformative experience. And so <clears throat> when I'm at places, you know, like I was at University of Utah last week, and I was eating dinner with the faculty afterwards, and this humanities teacher who was, teaches engineers said, I had this student come to me and say, why are we doing this big case study on the, you know, the nuclear uh, spill on Long Island, or th wherever it was, I'm forgetting, Three Mile Island, right? And this is an old case, and why am I doing this? I'm going to be an engineer, and I don't know why. And then he's at, this, at the talk about the book, and I go through, like what I do with SOAR, and then he goes to his teacher after and says, all right, I've got my answer. Like, they're not, they're not so frustrated about gen ed. They're just frustrated they don't know why they're there. Right. And so you have these students come up and just say, this just really helps me. And if they've been in college just a little while, they say, this, is, this confirms what's actually happening to me. And it, so, yeah, it's a simple, like, go to college and, and get a job and get your house and your car and your dog and your whatever, you know, like you've got all that out there, but that's the, the nice outcome of, of becoming an educated person. Like that's, it's not necessarily the major, so. Thank you, Mark. Any other questions or comments or experiences that you all have had? Yes, please. Yeah, um, I mean, because I think obviously this is one way, but there's, I, I take the, and I think, well, I've been where I've taught right after you before. I think you do a great job of a lot of this kind of stuff, because I've heard half of your lectures. Um, but I think telling students as often and everywhere you can, right, here's why we're doing this. I, I have an assignment in one of my classes where students have to write a two page paper and then they have to revise it, revise it, revise it until it's mechanically perfect. And if they don't write a mechanically perfect paper by the end of the semester, they fail the course, no matter what they've done on everything else. Now, they're not happy about this at first, right? Uh, one, because the penalty for failing is so high, and, and um, 
And then, I'm an engineer. Why do I have to know how to use a semicolon, right? Um, but they know, actually. You just need to point it out to them. So I pulled up a blog um, and went down to the comment section. And it didn't take too very long to find a comment that was rife with grammatical errors. And I said, all right, read these comments and tell me what you think of each of these commenters. And of course, when you read a blog post that's, right, these like, idiots, right? I mean, you immediately write that person off if it's poorly, poorly written. We maybe we shouldn't judge books by their cover, but we do, right? And the written word's not going away. The written word's everywhere, right? It's now on screens instead of on pages, but the written word is every place. And, and I said, look, you're going to be judged. Um, I'm on a school board in town, and we get applications from teachers where there are spelling errors on the front page of their CV. You just toss that in the, into the recycling bin straight away. You know, I'm not even looking at the rest of this. My goodness, you want, to be, you want to be a middle school English teacher and you've got a spelling error on the front page of your CV? So, I mean, those kinds of like concrete, practical look, you know, this, these supposedly disconnected skills, they are extremely practical, as it turns out. But no, I, 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 I think everywhere you can, first of all, there's also this benefit. Students are happier about courses when they know why the course was valuable. And when you tell students over and over, here's what we're doing, here's why it's valuable, maybe even use the idea evaluation language that hopefully you've put on your syllabus, and you might even, every single time you do an assignment, we're doing this because remember I told you that this is what this class is about, and we talked about why having that skill is really valuable for you in all these ways. Your course evaluations will go up. Because the students know what they're doing and why they're doing it. And so they end up being happier right? uh, and probably more successful because they're more directed. So there's all kinds of benefits from putting this in every occasion you can. And I, I just have my students write like a one-page single-space response to the book at the beginning of the semester. And some of them have taken my, three of my classes, and they, they have to do every time. And we talk about what that means and what their experiences are and what they think. And we have a nice discussion. And then I lay out this is how this class is built for a learner. This is how it's building your abilities. This is my promise to you. This is why I'm doing it. And it's, it's been helpful. I mean, in my leadership class, they have to read a 748-page biography of Abraham Lincoln. Like small, it's a huge book. And I just say, this is why we're doing it, and this is what it means, and this is why this case study matters, and this is how we're going to connect it. And you need to, you know, part of being a leader is to be able to read widely and understand people's stories. And, and I just lay it all out there. And the first semester, I did it. I had to do a lot. The students were just like, really? I have to read this? And now like, the reputation of the class goes long, and I have this explanation. And they're just like, OK. And most of them read it. I mean, most of them have a pretty good experience with it. Because I haven't just said, well, this is what we're reading, and this is what we're doing. I think even in a junior or senior level class, to stop back and say, what does it mean to learn how to learn and to be an educated person? And how are you doing in this? Gives them a chance to reflect. And as they go on it, in their sophomore year, their junior year, their senior year, and they get this message again, they pick up different things. So any way you can weave it in to that conversation, remind them of, or just, and from stories. Please. That's an area of needed development. And so, um, Heidi, go ahead. So transfer students will get the book, but we've been having discussions about having some kind of a like a mini connections experience for transfer students. Um, because transfer students are, you're quite right to note, oftentimes sort of cut out of the way in which this particular institution wants to shape um, uh, students. Though in part, the more that this kind of message gets embedded in every class they take, hopefully it's sort of everywhere they turn, they're getting it. And I actually think a very common mistake on the part of faculty is it's all inside baseball for us. So it's, it's obvious why we're having students do this stuff. I mean, why would you have to say it out loud? But you have to say it out loud. It, 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 it matters. Say it out loud so they know why they're doing it. They'll be happier. Well, the interesting thing was before I published the book and before Harris and I did all this work together, we were doing it separately in our own classes. We spent the first day of class or the first week of class talking about what college is and what its ends are and why it's important. 
And we were just having our own conversations from our own experiences and laying these things out and having great success with it with the students. So whatever, wherever your class is at, whether summer transfer students or whatever, just engage that conversation in whatever way you think is useful with whatever piece of reading or <coughs> lecture, TED Talk, whatever you want to do, but give them some material to write about and think about and engage them in that conversation up front and it'll just clear a whole bunch of debris out of your way and then they can move forward a lot more more productively and happily. Yeah, everyone ends up being happier for it. Any other comments or questions? Heidi. Well, and find, and find places to have these conversations with fellow faculty. What do you guys talk about? Uh, how do you, what, what techniques do you use? You know, what, I just read this great article. Show it to your students. It explains why engineers need to know how to write. Um, I hope that this becomes, we hope that this becomes a faculty conversation. Students are having the conversation. We want faculty to have it too so that it's sort of institutionalized everywhere. Well, thank you very much. Feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions.